On Sunday, December 7, 1958, around 1 p.m., the Martin family gathered into their 1954 cream and red colored Ford station wagon and headed towards the Columbia River Gorge. Their intention was to collect greenery from the surrounding woodlands to use for Christmas decorations around their home. Three hours later, the family stopped at a gas station in the city of Cascade Locks, 40 miles from their home, where they ate at Paradise Snack Bar in the city of Hood River, 20 miles further from Cascade Locks. So at this point, they were about 60 miles from home. Their waitress at Paradise Snack Bar confirmed that all appeared normal with the family and they left the restaurant around 5 p.m., which was already found weird by many, as Ken Martin was known to avoid driving at night due to his eyesight. This was the last time any sightings of the Martin family could be verified. On December 9th, Ken's boss reported him missing, as he had not shown up to work, something that was extremely out of character for him. That same night at around 11 p.m., police arrived at the home of the Martin family. There were no signs of a break-in or foul play. There were dishes still in the sink, and a load of clothing was still in the washing machine, and a Santa Claus outfit from a Christmas party was even still laid out on a bed. Wherever the Martins had gone, they clearly intended to come back. Within days, their disappearance was all over the papers, and as many as five different police agencies all launched separate investigations to find the family. Police were able to verify that the family stopped at the gas station and the restaurant, but after that, they were at a loss for where the family could have gone. During the course of the initial search, the police found an abandoned white Chevy near Cascade Locks, which was from Los Angeles and had been reported stolen by its owner. This led police to search for two ex-convicts, Roy Light and Lester Price. There was some suspicion that the two may have been involved in the disappearance of the Martins, as the owner of the Paradise Snack Bar told the police that they were at the restaurant at the same time as the Martin family, leaving shortly after the Martins. But without substantial proof to connect them to the disappearance, they were never questioned. Strangely, days after their disappearance, police would continue to get calls reporting sightings of the Martins from all over the area. Several alleged witnesses claimed to see the Martins or people matching their description in other parts of Oregon, Iowa, and even Montana, but none of these sightings could be verified. Two witnesses claimed to see the Martin station wagon around dusk parked under the Bridge of the Gods in Cascade Locks with two men standing next to the vehicle and speaking to the passengers inside, though this couldn't be verified. But if it was true, this was the last known time they were seen alive. Many came to believe that they had accidentally driven into the Columbia River. Pretty soon, though, a very important discovery in the investigation was made when tire tracks were found leading to a cliff above the river and cream-colored paint chips consistent with the color of the Martin station wagon were found on the rocks below. The location of the tracks suggested that an accident was unlikely as the spot was not close to the road. Efforts to search this portion of the river, though, proved fruitless when two police officers shot down the idea, claiming it was too dangerous and that no divers should be sent down there, even though Detective Walter Graven was told by two professional divers that this would be a good place to dive and anyone who knows how to dive would have no trouble in this area. In the early morning of May 2nd, 1959, a fisherman and his wife reported something strange floating downstream near the Bonneville Dam in the Columbia River Gorge near Portland, Oregon. To them, it appeared to be two bodies, and unfortunately, they were right. The following day, one of the bodies was found on the north bank of the Columbia River, and the next morning, the second body was recovered. They belonged to Susan and Virginia Martin, ages 11 and 13. Though the official cause of death for both girls was determined to be drowning, a technician reportedly spotted what he believed to be bullet wounds in each of their heads and informed Dr. Waterman, the medical examiner. In his report, however, Waterman stated that no such injuries were found. Likewise, no police reports or newspaper articles from the time indicated that any signs of foul play were present. The examination also revealed that both Virginia and Susan had eaten burgers and fries within two hours of their deaths, consistent with the testimony of the waitress from Paradise Snack Bar. Dr. Waterman claimed to have received several threatening phone calls after the bodies had been discovered. Each time, the voice of what sounded like a young man warned Dr. Waterman that he would be harmed should any of the other missing Martins be identified. But there was actually one surviving member of the Martin family, Donald Martin. Donald had a strained relationship with his family due to him possibly being gay and having been caught with a man in the home by his parents. He never came out to aid in the search for his parents and sisters, claiming that his aunt Charlotte had encouraged him to stay put in New York. However, Charlotte refuted this claim, stating that she didn't understand why Donald hadn't traveled to Oregon to help look for his family. 
Donald also didn't attend the memorial services for either of his sisters, claiming to have gotten the dates mixed up. As the only surviving family member, Donald was the sole beneficiary of the Martin estate, totaling around $36,000 at the time. Four years earlier, Donald had been fired from his job at the Meyer and Frank, a department store in Portland. He had been fired for stealing over $2,000 worth of merchandise. One theory suggests that Donald had some involvement in the disappearance of his family, not just because of his poor relationship with his family. No, there was something much worse that came up. A 38 automatic pistol covered in blood was discovered under a rock near Cascade Locks in January 1959. A single spent bullet was found in the chamber of the gun. Bizarrely, the weapon was never processed as evidence and was later cleaned and returned to the man who found it. When investigators traced the gun's serial number, they learned it was one of the items Donald Martin was accused of stealing from Meyer and Frank back in 1954. Despite this, Donald was never outwardly accused of having any involvement in the disappearances. To this day, Ken, Barbara, and Barbie Martin's bodies remain unfound, along with their vehicle. On Boxing Day 1996, a harrowing and painful 26 years ago, the milk carton kids, 11-year-old Patrick Warren and 13-year-old David Spencer, disappeared from Birmingham, England and have never been seen since. The two boys were best friends. Patrick was described as a wild boy who wasn't necessarily an angel, but by other accounts, he was a terrific little lad. He loved football and was definitely cheeky, but completely loved nonetheless. David, known as a keen boxer, was very street smart for his age. His mother described him as an adorable and lovely lad and although he had been involved in delinquent behaviours and appeared to have his troubles, he was extremely bright and was doted on by his family. Having just celebrated Christmas, the two boys spent Boxing Day playing outside near their homes in Chelmsley Wood. In a time of spreading happiness and spending time with family and friends, both of the boys had told their parents that they were going to spend the night at Patrick's brother's house and left their respective homes, but this would be the the last time that their distraught parents would ever see them. Patrick was riding his new red bicycle and David was on foot. The route to Patrick's brother's house was a short one, but they decided to spend some more time playing out in the neighbourhood before setting off to their final destination. At around 12.45am, the two boys crossed the road to a petrol station that was just minutes away from their homes. They asked the attendant for a packet of biscuits, and then the attendant watched as they walked away towards Chelmsley Wood Shopping Centre. This sighting of the boys was the final time that they were seen alive. In the days following their disappearance, the police treated the investigation as a runaway case. They believed that there was no reason to assume that the boys had been met with harm and suggested that they may have been staying with friends or that their disappearance had been part of a big game. Because the boys were deemed to be streetwise, this was something that police heavily stressed to the public, which painted a picture to the world that their disappearance was probably not a matter of urgency. This would turn out to be a grave mistake. Despite this, the police started their inquiry by knocking on doors and speaking to neighbours, searching buildings and other areas that the boys often frequented. They also offered a £500 reward for information on anybody who may have been sheltering the boys, but there was no confirmed sightings and no information came to light. The boys' homes were also searched, but nothing relating to their disappearance was found. In late January 1997, a press conference was held and the boys' mothers appealed for them to come home, but again, this turned up nothing, leaving the families both confused and devastated. The National Missing Persons Helpline soon started a campaign in which they displayed the pictures of missing children on milk cartons to spread the word on these types of cases. Patrick and David were the first children to appear on Four Point Milk Cartons, which were sold across 770 Iceland stores. This earned them the Milk Carton Kid's name. However, after four weeks of its distribution, there were no major leads, and the campaign failed to grab the attention of the national media. The lack of urgency in the police department saw the disregard of potential clues to the boys' disappearance. On December 27th, Patrick's bike was found abandoned behind the petrol station where the boys were last seen. It took them several weeks to realise that this bike belonged to Patrick. This made it clear that the chance of this being a runaway case was very unlikely. Patrick had only just received this bike as a Christmas gift, and if he were to run away, the chances of him abandoning it himself would be very small. There was also speculation that the police did not take their story seriously enough, 
because of their reputation as kids who misbehaved on occasion and because they came from a council estate. This played into the stereotype that the pair were streetwise and naughty enough to not be treated as vulnerable, but instead as adults who could hold their own, when in actual fact they were just young children. By 2006, detectives believed that they were looking at a murder case, although they did not have any bodies. An appeal was made on BBC Crime Watch, which led to the arrest of a 37-year-old man who was later released without charge. The offender's register had also finally been looked into, but no in the area were questioned and ruled out of the investigation. However, in 2001, a man named Brian Lunfield, who is most infamously known for the SA and a 14-year-old Roy Tootill in 1968, was arrested at his Birmingham flat and DNA evidence saw him convicted for the crime. At the time that Patrick and David went missing, Brian lived just a few miles away in Solihull and had already served a prison sentence for the kidnapping of two other boys in the 1980s. Brian was also a landscape gardener, which led people to speculate that he could have easily disposed of the boys' bodies. Brian was also said to have been driving around the area of the boys' last sighting on the night of their disappearance whilst under the influence of alcohol. This seemed like crucial information as Brian was known to be intoxicated when he committed most of his prior crimes and had once admitted himself that it was a driving factor for his criminal mindset. Brian was questioned in connection to the two boys and an area of land that he used as a dumping ground in Old Damson Lane in Solihull was also dug up in search of evidence. Nothing was found and, without any evidence, police were unable to to get a confession from Brian. Despite this, Brian is still considered to be a person of interest in the case, as his history of offences and timeline of events match up to that of Patrick and David's disappearance. In 2021, David's brother Leo Toole took matters into his own hands and decided to dig a piece of land in Solihull after receiving a tip-off that someone had been digging in a field off Damson Wood Lane near Solihull Moors Football Club around the time of the boys' disappearance. Lee has expressed his anger towards the police, who had allegedly been informed of this for years, but they had never investigated it. To this day, the boys' disappearance still remains unsolved. No trace of them has ever been found, and their families lost all trust that they once had in the police. After 26 years of pain, confusion, and utter disappointment, they finally deserve answers about what happened to their beloved children all those years ago. If you have any information that could lead to the discovery of evidence and an arrest or even information regarding the boys that may seem insignificant, please reach out to the following sources as this could provide closure and peace to so many that have been affected by this tragic case. Imagine being on the phone with your son and hearing the exact moment he disappeared forever. That's what happened to the parents of Brandon Swanson, who mysteriously vanished in 2008. That year, on May 14th, Brandon went out to celebrate the end of classes with his friends. After attending a couple of parties, he decided to drive home. However, instead of taking the most direct route, he drove through a farming road and accidentally ended up in a ditch. Brandon was okay, but he called his parents asking them to come and fetch him. But although they drove around the area he told them he was in for hours, they couldn't find him in the dark. He then suggested they meet in the parking lot of a nearby nightclub and decided to cross a field to take a shortcut. Brandon's father was on the phone with his son and he suddenly heard him shout, Oh sh before the call was cut off, Brandon's phone was turned off after that, and he was never seen again. Despite the extensive search effort involving police dogs, air surveillance, and hundreds of volunteers, the teen's disappearance still remains a mystery. Pamela Hobley and Patricia Spencer were two high school students out of Skoda, Michigan. On October 31, 1969, Pamela, 15, and Patricia, 16, skipped their afternoon classes. Since there was a homecoming game that night, followed by a Halloween party, it was believed they had decided to skip class to get ready. Pamela had told her mother and sisters that she would be attending the party and would be home after that. But when her family got home from trick-or-treating, Pamela's boyfriend called them and told them she had never made it to the party. After a few phone calls, they learned Patricia hadn't been seen at the Halloween party either. Both girls were reported missing that night, and the police got involved. At first, and considering the girls' ages, this was treated as a runaway case. However, even though the girls attended the same school, they were not actually close friends, so it was unclear why they would run away together. The families weren't convinced either. Both girls had healthy relationships with their families and had no reason to take off. Also, they had left their IDs and little money they had behind, 
so running away just seemed unlikely. According to the first investigation, the girls were last seen walking away from their high school. However, years later, a man came forward saying he had given the girls a ride to downtown Oskoda. This man was cleared as a suspect and is not believed to have had anything to do with their disappearance. Other witnesses stated the girls were given a ride to a gas station in the area. The police suspect they tried to hitchhike their way from there, but got picked up by someone who kidnapped and eventually murdered them. In 1985, the police began looking into a barn in the area, which was a popular spot for teenage parties in the late 60s. A search of the property was conducted, and no detectable evidence of human remains was discovered. The owner of the property was considered a suspect, but is now deceased, and was never confirmed to be involved in the case. Despite these efforts, neither Pamela nor Patricia were ever seen or heard from again, and their case is still, to this day, unsolved. One of the strangest missing persons cases I've ever seen revolves around someone that might not even exist. Let me explain. In 1989, a local Chicago television station called WMAQ was wrapping up their regularly scheduled television for the night, when all of a sudden the audio was cut and the image on screen was changed to a strange missing persons panel. The image of the individual shown was too low quality to make out any details and no information other than the woman's name, Joanna Lopez, were given. The broadcast wouldn't be too out of the ordinary if it wasn't for the fact that she was never mentioned anywhere again, and when people tried to find her, they found no records of a woman named Joanna Lopez in Chicago, even with police filings. So who was this woman in the broadcast, and how did a missing persons panel for her end up on the news? Well, when the news agency was asked about the panel, they claimed it was sent by an anonymous person, which leaves us with the most likely answer being that it was a prank or an alternate reality game. And as for who was actually in the photo, the lead seems to be a woman by the name of Rachel Lopez. A photo of her was found in a West Chicago yearbook from 1990, and although she has a different first name than Joanna, the fact that they look so similar and share a last name leads many to believe that she could be the one in the photo. Sadly though, it seems like we may never know for sure, as no one has been able to contact the woman in the yearbook. This murder case is what made me kind of believe in like paranormal activity. So there's this unsolved case that happened at this hotel where this woman who looked to be like Asian descent uh, entered into this elevator and she went inside the elevator and then she starts looking out of the elevator like somebody's chasing her or somebody, she's just expecting somebody to show up, right? And then eventually, she just disappears. What do you mean she disappears, bro? So she literally just disappears. There's no more footage of her. And then I believe it was months after they found her body inside one of the hotel like water tanks. She fell in or what? Yeah, it's, it was believed that she fell in. Right. Nobody, nobody knows if she was killed or she just walked in there, but it was kind of weird, bro. Have you ever heard of the Sims family murders? On October 22nd of 1966, Robert and Helen were at home with their youngest daughter, Joy, in Tallahassee, Florida. When Robert and Helen's oldest daughter came home after babysitting, she found Robert and Helen tied up and shot on their bed. Joy was laying on the floor and she had been shot and stabbed. Robert and Helen were transported to the hospital. Robert ended up dying that same day, but Helen hung on for nine days. She would die later. And Joy had been pronounced dead at the scene. The investigation came up with almost nothing. It didn't take long for robbery to be ruled out as nothing had been taken from the home. Police combed through the area in hopes of finding something. They even drained a nearby pond to see if they could find anything at all. Nothing was ever found. 
Years later, a couple of suspects would come up. One of the Sims' neighbors was convicted of murder, but that lead didn't pan out either. And police also considered a local pastor. Helen had worked for him as a secretary and had quit just a few days before the murders happened. But nothing solid has ever been found, and 55 years later, the case is still unsolved. These are the cases that bother me probably the most. No motive, no explanation, and no one was ever caught for it. So what are your thoughts? Leave them in the comments and follow for more true crime. This disturbing case of the freeway phantom killer remains unsolved. In 1971, Washington DC was experiencing its first ever serial killer. In April that year, 13-year-old Carol Spinks was walking to a local shop to get some food for her family. After purchasing dinner, she headed home, but she would disappear on the short walk back. Tragically, the young girl's body was discovered six days later. She'd been SA'd and strangled to death. However, this would not be the last tragic killing that the community would experience. Just two months later, another body was found. The victim was discovered in exactly the same spot that Carol was found in. This was right next to the freeway. Locals were terrified of the so-called freeway killer. The killer then made a terrifying move that no one was expecting. The third victim was Brenda Crockett. She was only 10 years old and again, she'd gone to the shops for food and never returned home. This time, however, her family received a terrifying phone call. Now, Brenda's mum had realized she'd vanished and she'd gone out looking for her. While she did, the phone rang. Brenda's younger sister was actually inside and she took the phone call. Her sister told her that she was in Virginia and a man had snatched her. Then there was another call half an hour later. Brenda asked, did my mother see me? Then she whispered, well, I'll see you. The phone hung up and Brenda was found deceased a day later. In October, 12-year-old Nenemoshia Yates vanished on her way home from the shops. A mere two hours later, her body was found by a passerby. Again, something was coming that nobody expected from this killer. 16-year-old Brenda Woodard disappeared. This time when her body was found, there was a note in the pocket. The note was actually written in Brenda's handwriting. This led police to believe that the killer dictated the note and Brenda wrote it. It says, this is tantamount to my insensitivity to people, especially women. I will admit the others when you catch me if you can. And it's signed the freeway phantom. Now things went quiet and the community thought that they were finally safe. However, 10 months later, 17 year old Diane Williams was killed. This time the killer callously phoned her parents and said, I killed your daughter. Police were initially suspicious of Robert Askins. He'd actually been in prison for another murder. When they searched his property, they found photos of girls and a knife. Now he wasn't actually convicted of any of the freeway killings. He was however imprisoned for kidnapping and SAing other girls. Shockingly, in 2009, police admitted that they lost the entire case file. This is including potential DNA evidence. There still remains a $150,000 reward for information. Have you ever heard of the Villisca Axe murders in Villisca, Iowa? On June 19th of 1912, Josiah and Sarah Moore, along with their four children and two of their neighbors, went to church. After the church service was over around 9.30, they came home, had milk and cookies, and all of them went to bed. At 7.30 the next morning, the Moore's neighbor became worried when she didn't see them out doing their morning chores. She called Josiah's brother, and after a search of the house, they realized that every last one of them had been murdered and all of them had been bludgeoned with Josiah's axe. Police found a four pound slab of bacon next to the axe. They also found that the murderer had rummaged through their clothes and hung up clothes all over all of the mirrors and their windows. It also looked like the murderer had cooked himself a meal, but it was left untouched on the kitchen table. There was also a bowl of bloody water next to it. There was one suspect and it was a traveling preacher by the name of Lynn George Jacqueline Kelly. Lynn left suddenly on July 10th, early in the morning. He also told people that there were eight dead souls left in Villisca. Lynn also had a troubled history of sending obscene stuff in the mail. He was known for his odd behavior. Lynn was charged with the murders and he even signed a confession. He recanted that confession during trial and the jury was deadlocked. 
They got together a second jury and that jury acquitted him. And no one else has ever been charged with the murders. So what are your thoughts on this? Let me know in the comments and follow for more true crime. Have you ever heard of Mary Schley? And if I pronounce that wrong, please correct me in the comments. On February 15th of 1974, Dennis Anderson was coming home with his dog after running errands all day. They were enjoying the ride, so they decided to cruise a little bit longer, and they ended up on a dead-end road. Dennis came across what he thought were two men fighting. There was also a car parked along the side of the road. He continued to drive, but the further he got, the worse he felt about what he had seen. He decided to turn around and see if anyone needed help, but when he got back to the scene, he saw a body lying in the ditch and the car was gone. Thinking the person needed help, Dennis rushed back home and enlisted his neighbor, Dan Murphy, to come help him. When they got back to the scene, they realized that the person was dead. They called police and they found a young woman's body lying in the ditch. They immediately knew that it was a homicide. Police took tire impressions, but they were pretty unusable as it had just snowed. They also found a black and orange cap with several hairs inside of it near the scene. They also discovered that it was Mary Schley. Mary had been stabbed 15 times in the neck, back, and stomach. Mary had put up a fight though. She had several defensive wounds on her hands and she also had blood and skin samples under her fingernails. They did preserve these blood and skin samples and followed any lead that they possibly had. They also tried to match the hair to 12 people that it could possibly be, but they found nothing. Mary loved to travel. She had seen most of the United States and even parts of Europe, and she had done all of this while hitchhiking. Mary was actually on her way to Chicago when she was murdered. She planned on hitchhiking from her home in Minneapolis, Minnesota, all the way to Chicago. She was murdered just two hours into her trip. So could it be that someone who picked her up did this to her? Let me know your thoughts in the comments and follow for more true crime. Have you ever heard of Vanessa Malone? Vanessa went by Honey and she was a beautiful 18-year-old girl living in Stone Mountain, Georgia. On October 23rd of 2012, after Vanessa worked her shift at a clothing store, she told her mother she was going to go visit some new friends. She walked over to Hampton Village Apartment Complex, room 6902. Police received a 911 call from the couple living in the apartment later that day. The couple said three to six men broke into their apartment, tied them up, and forced them into the bathroom. They said they heard Vanessa enter the apartment, and that was followed by gunshots. After they were sure the men had left, they untied themselves and called 911. Vanessa was found shot multiple times and left in a closet. The robbery angle was hard to believe as nothing was stolen from the apartment except for Vanessa's phone, which was found about half a mile from the scene. Police concluded that it was drug violence and Vanessa had just been at the wrong place at the wrong time, but her family disagrees. Vanessa's family believes that she had some information that the murderers didn't want to come out, that she had been targeted. April 3rd of 2020, there was a break in the case. Donald Ash was arrested at his mom's house in connection to Vanessa's murder. Police didn't reveal why they arrested Donald Ash or there's very little out there about it, but they do believe that there are more people involved. So what are your thoughts on this case? Let me know in the comments and follow for more true crime. Have you ever heard of Sally Horner? In March of 1948, Sally stole a notebook on a dare. She was caught by a man who said he was an FBI agent. He said that Sally would need to report to him regularly or she'd be sent to reform school. The man was Frank LaSalle and he was a registered sex offender. In June of 1948, Frank abducted Sally. He forced her to call her parents saying that he was the father of two of her school friends and that he had invited her to go on vacation in New Jersey with them. Frank kept Sally for 21 months traveling to many different US states. While Sally was attending school in Dallas, she told one of her friends what was actually happening. Sally was able to escape Frank and she called her sister, asking her sister to send the FBI. March 22nd of 1950, Frank was arrested. He tried telling police that he was Sally's father, but they found that Sally's father had died several years ago. Frank had repeatedly essayed Sally during this time, and he was eventually sentenced to 30 to 35 years in prison. 
Sadly, Sally died in a car accident in 1952, so it's just a tragic story all around. What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments and follow for more true crime. Have you ever heard of Mary Badaracco? Mary went missing in August of 1984. She's never been seen again. Dominic claimed when he came home from work, Mary was gone. Her wedding ring was there and the $100,000 that he had offered her to buy her out of her portion of the house was also gone. Dominic was said to be very abusive during their relationship. While Mary always made sure her kids never saw the physical violence, she would often have new bruises and the kids would come home to the house being trashed. Dominic divorced Mary in 1985 while she was still a missing person. And in 1986, state police interviewed a man who was in the Federal Witness Protection Program. He was a former Hells Angel. He told police that Dominic had asked his son from a previous marriage, Joe, to whack Mary. Mary's case was reclassified from missing persons to a homicide in 1990, and still nothing would be found. In 2007, they got a tip that Mary's car might have been buried in someone's backyard. Ernie Daschenhausen was an excavator, and he was friends with Dominic at the time, so he very well could have buried Mary's car. They dug up the backyard to the house that Ernie used to live in, but they still didn't find anything. Dominic became the main suspect, and they convened a grand jury. Dominic tried to bribe the judge. He was hoping to get help from the judge. He was convicted of the bribery charge and sentenced to seven years in prison. Dominic was released early and was never sentenced or tried for his wife's disappearance. So what are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments and follow for more true crime. Have you ever heard of Andrea Yates? Andrea struggled with mental health issues her entire life. When she was a teenager, she struggled with an eating disorder and also self-harm. As an adult, she was diagnosed with depression, delusional thinking, and schizophrenia. Andrea seemed to be getting help with her mental health disorders and seemed to live a pretty stable life with her husband Russell and her five children. The family lived in a suburb of Houston and they were very religious. Andrea and Russell wanted to have as many children as nature would allow. Even though Andrea struggled with postpartum depression every time she had a child, and it seemed to get worse every single time. Andrea would turn back to self-harm after she had the children, and her mental health just seemed to decline. Andrea started to believe that her children were destined for hell because she was evil and she wasn't teaching them right. She was getting help and was being put on medication and this seemed to help and she seemed to be getting better until she stopped taking her meds again. June 20th of 2001, Russell left for work around 8.30. He had made plans with his mother to come in and take care of the children around 9.30, but it was too late. In the hours she had alone with her children, she drowned all five of them and laid them out on their bed. She then called police. She told them that she was saving her children from hell. Andrea was sentenced to life in 2002, but was given a new trial in 2005 when they found false testimony from her first trial. In the second trial, she was found not guilty by reason of insanity and sentenced to a low security mental health institution in Texas. So what are your thoughts on this case? Do you think that she got what she deserved or was it too light? Let me know your thoughts in the comments and follow for more true crime. Have you ever heard of Jeanette De Palma? Jeanette was born on August 3rd of 1956 in Jersey City, New Jersey. Her parents were Florence and Salvador De Palma and she was one of eight children. She was described as kind and just a good person. But as you can see, she was also very beautiful. The De Palma family was also a very religious family, so Jeanette grew up going to church and spending time growing in her religion. She even planned on going to Bible college after she graduated high school. But on top of being religious, Jeanette's friends knew her to have a little bit of a wild side. She liked to go out and party, and she did experiment a little bit with smoking some marijuana but it never got any worse than that. The only thing she ever did was smoke marijuana. When Jeanette was 16 years old, her and her family were living in Springfield Township, New Jersey. 
And on August 7th of 1972, Jeanette told her mother that she planned on going to visit her friend and she was going to take the train to go see her to her house. Jeanette never made it to her friend's house and she also never made it home that night. By the time evening rolled around and Jeanette hadn't made it home, her parents were immediately worried and called the police. If Jeanette's plans had changed or if she was going to be late or anything changed in her day-to-day -day schedule, she would call her parents and let them know what was going on. The search for Jeanette began immediately, but she wouldn't be found for six weeks. On September 19th of 1972, there was a dog owner that was walking their dog. They were walking in the Hoodale Park area, and I might have said that wrong, but they were walking in that area and the dog was off its leash so, it's, so it would kind of wander around and then come back to the owner. But one time when it came back, it was carrying something, and upon closer examination, the owner realized it was a human arm. At this point, everyone knew Jeanette was missing, and so the dog owner called the police immediately thinking that this might be Jeanette. After searching the park, police did finally find Jeanette's body and it was on top of a cliff. This cliff was called Devil's Teeth. Stranger yet is how some people allege that her body was found. Some people claim that she was found face down with a makeshift coffin around her and then also these handmade crosses around her that were like made of twigs and branches laying around her. And all of these crosses were inside the coffin area. There are some people who also claim that she was lying on top of a pentagram, but police officers deny that she was lying on top of a pentagram and that there was like ritualistic things about this. Part two is up. This is part two to Jeanette De Palma. Jeanette's body was very severely decomposed and so they were unable to do like a full autopsy, but they were able to rule out that she had any gunshot wounds or any stab wounds. There were also no drugs found on Jeanette's body or around the area that she was found. The medical examiner was also able to find that she had very unusually high amounts of lead in her body. They concluded that Jeanette had probably died due to strangulation. There were basically no clues when it came to what had happened to Jeanette. They, the FBI did come in and try to uh, test some stains that were found in her bra and underwear, but they said that the remain or the stains were too decomposed and they were unable to get any DNA or foreign stuff substances from her clothes. There was one suspect and this was a homeless man named Red that lived in the park um, that took off very quickly after Jeanette disappeared, but he was found and ruled out very quickly. But with the rumors surrounding the strange way that Jeanette was found, it didn't take long for the media to take off with the idea that she had been a victim of human sacrifice. This was kind of during the time of satanic panic, so local media outlets were blaming a local witch's coven for her death. But police deny this claim. There is one police officer who was the one that found Jeanette initially that said that she was not found in this way. He thinks that she was strictly murdered by someone and they haven't found out who it is. He also claims that these rumors started by another police officer that was at the scene that suggested the satanic aspect of this whole thing. Jeanette's nephew has also came out and said that he believes that Jeanette was simply murdered by somebody and somebody still knows what happened to her. There was also a newspaper magazine that started looking into her death and they believe that there is a massive police cover up in this case, that the police are covering up what actually happened to Jeanette. And they say that the uh, Springfield Police Department lost her case file, but the Springfield Police Department says that her case file was destroyed in 1999 due to Hurricane Floyd. But then there's also some officers that say that her case is still on file. I did a deeper dive of this case over on my YouTube channel, so if you want to check that out, you can. It's linked in my bio. Just hit the little Instagram button. It'll take you there. Or you can just search my username and it'll you'll find me on YouTube. So if you're interested, you can check that out. But what are your thoughts on what happened to Jeanette? I'd love to know down in the comments. And as always, follow for more true crime. Have you ever heard of the Clutter family? 
The Clutter family was the typical all-American family back in the 1950s. Bonnie and Herbert Clutter had four children all together, but their oldest two had already moved away from the house. They had graduated high school and moved on. Herbert Clutter was a very prominent farmer in the Southwest Kansas area in Holcomb, Kansas. Holcomb only had about 300 people living in the town in 1959. Herbert was married to Bonnie Clutter and she has a reputation of being bedridden for most of her life or like a depressed person, but that's actually not true. Bonnie was very involved in her kids' life. She was very involved in the community and she was very active. She did have some back problems and so sometimes she would have to go rest, but she was very involved overall and a very happy woman. Nancy was 16 years old and she was very popular in school, very well liked. She was the class president and just one of those girls that was just loved by all. Kenyon, on the other hand, was more quiet and liked to stay to himself. He was 15. So like I said, Herbert was a very successful farmer and that meant that he would employ plenty of people. A lot of those people were guys that would just kind of come through the area and just work seasonally for him. One of those people was Floyd Wells. After Floyd left Herbert's farm some time after, he was arrested and was currently residing in the Kansas State Prison about 300 miles away from Holcomb, Kansas. Floyd's cellmate was Richard Hickok. During their time together in prison, Floyd would tell Richard about Herbert Clutter and how he was a very wealthy man and how he kept a safe in his home that had about $10,000 in it. $10,000 in 1959 is like $102,000 in today's money. Richard had once been the cellmate of Perry Smith. Perry had already been released from prison and so Richard sent a letter to Perry saying, hey, after I get out in November, let's hook up and I have a job for us to do, job. So after Richard was released, him and Perry got back together and Richard told Perry all about Herbert Clutter and the safe he had in his home. They got together an old Chevy and a knife and a flashlight and just things that they would need. They then made the 300 mile journey from Eastern Kansas all the way to Holcomb, Kansas. They arrived in Holcomb on the night of November 14th, 1959. Part two is up. Here's part two to the Clutter family murders. Richard Hickok and Perry Smith had made it to Holcomb, Kansas, and when they knew that the whole family was asleep, they made entrance into the house in an unlocked door. This part of the country is considered very safe, and a lot of times people will sleep with the doors unlocked. They woke up Herbert demanding to know where this safe with $10,000 was. Herbert had no idea what they were talking about. Herbert did give them a $50 bill, which is about $500 in today's money, and was trying to get them to leave. They weren't satisfied with this, so they took Bonnie, Nancy, and Kenyon and put them into a bathroom and then took Herbert into his office demanding to know where the safe was. When Herbert still didn't tell them where the safe was, they took Herbert and Kenyon down into the basement, tied them up, and then Bonnie tied her up and put her in her bed and then Nancy tied her up and put her in her bed. Richard and Perry looked all through the house and when they couldn't find anything they went into each individual room where the family was staying and shot all the victims. They left the house with the $50 that Herbert had given them, a transistor radio, and some binoculars. The family wasn't found until the next morning when a 16-year-old best friend of Nancy's came to pick her up. She found the family dead and they called the police and they arrived by 10 p.m. It didn't take long for KBI to get involved and Alvin Dewey took charge of the investigation. He had been a friend of Herbert Clutter, so he was really looking for the person who murdered his, his friend. They weren't really finding anything, so they started interviewing everyone, people who had previously worked for Herbert, Bonnie's uh, doctor, the kids as friends, like everyone. It wasn't until Floyd Wells came forward and told the KBI that he was the one who told Richard about the, her, the Clutter family. He asked that he get the thousand dollar reward and also be get an early release from prison. The KBI finally caught up to Richard and Perry uh, on December 30th of 1959, so about a month and a half later. 
they were in Las Vegas awaiting a package that they had sent to themselves from Mexico. They had been all over Mexico, California, Nevada, Florida, just everywhere. Both of them confessed and then they were sentenced to death. They spent about five years on death row and then on April 14th of 1964, both were hung for their crimes. I did a deeper dive of this case over on my YouTube channel, so if that's something you're interested, you can hit the little Instagram button in my bio, it'll take you right there, or you can just search my username and it'll pop up. But what are your thoughts on this? Let me know down in the comments and follow for more true crime. Have you ever heard of Kelsey Barrett? Kelsey was born on September 15th of 1989. She was described as quiet, but very sweet and very dedicated to her faith. Originally, she was from Moses Lake, Washington, and when she was young, she always dreamed of being a pilot. She did become a pilot, and when she met a man on the internet named Patrick Frazee, she decided to move to Colorado to be closer to him. She moved to Woodland Park, Colorado, and then took a job as a pilot instructor at the Falcon Air Force Base in Grand Junction, which was about an hour away. Kelsey bought her own townhome, but it did seem like her and Patrick had wanted to move in together at some point and were just waiting for the right time. But they also did have a daughter together. They seemed like a very happy couple and everyone was under the impression that everything was going just fine. But on December 2nd of 2018, Kelsey's mother, Cheryl, called the local police department in Colorado saying that she hadn't heard from her daughter in a while and wanted them to do a welfare check at her house. When police arrived at her house, they noticed that the house seemed clean and everything seemed put away. Her cell phone and her purse were gone and there was also some food on the counter that had gone stale. But anything she would need to go on a trip was still there. They went and spoke to her employer and her employer said that she had sent a text message saying she was going to take a week off for a vacation. Her coworkers weren't that concerned because they knew that her and that Kelsey and Patrick had recently had a fight and she was pretty stressed out about this. When Cheryl talked to Patrick, he said that he had gotten kind of the same text, but he, that Kelsey had left their one-year-old daughter with him. Patrick also told Cheryl that he and Kelsey had broken up, which was news to her. The last time that Cheryl had spoke to her daughter was on November 22nd, which was Thanksgiving Day in 2018. Kelsey told her that she had planned on making a Thanksgiving dinner for herself and Patrick, and everything seemed fine. Looking a little deeper, they found surveillance footage of Kelsey entering the local Safeway around 12 o'clock on November 22nd. She's then seen leaving around 12.30 to 12.40. This is the last time she is seen alive. They were also able to track her cell phone and they tracked her cell phone all the way to Gooding, Idaho, which was 800 miles away from Woodland Park, Colorado but it really seemed like there were not a lot of leads and there weren't any suspects, at least police weren't saying there were. Patrick also said that he was being cooperative by giving a DNA sample and giving his cell phone over to be checked by police. Part two is up. Here is the case of Kelsey Barrett part two. So at some point during this investigation, trying to find Kelsey, Kelsey's mother, Cheryl, found a stain in her home while she was looking around for other clues. Police were able to confirm that it was blood, and when they did a deeper search, they found something very disturbing. They found huge amounts of blood all over Kelsey's townhouse. And at this point, they knew something was very wrong. Patrick lived on a 35-acre ranch that his mother owned and he managed, and on December 14th of 2018, police executed a search warrant of the entire ranch. This search warrant lasted for days, and they took bags of evidence and also a truck that Patrick owned. Then they made the connection to Gooding, Iowa, where Kelsey's phone had pinged. This is Crystal Lee Kenny, and she and Patrick had had an on-again, off-again relationship for the last 10 years. And it turns out that she had Kelsey's phone, and she was the one sending the text messages. Crystal decided to become a witness for the state, and she told police everything that had happened. 
According to Crystal, Patrick had wanted full custody of his and Kelsey's daughter. He told Crystal that Kelsey was abusive and an alcoholic and a drug addict, and he concocted three different plans for Crystal to kill Kelsey. When Crystal was unable to do so, Patrick took matters into his own hands. He went to Kelsey's uh, townhouse and blindfolded her and wanted to told her they were going to play this game where she would smell something and she would try to figure out what it was. And while she was blindfolded, he beat her with a baseball bat over 15 times. According to Patrick, her last words were, please stop. Patrick was arrested and charged with Kelsey's murder, but while he was in custody, he tried having other people assassinate witnesses for him. So he was charged with that too. The dude's just kind of dumb. Crystal was charged with tampering with evidence and was sentenced to three years, but that sentence was later reduced to only 18 months and she is currently free. Patrick was sentenced to life in prison, but he is currently trying to appeal his sentencing or his verdict. And unfortunately, Kelsey's body has never been found. I did a deeper dive of this case over on my YouTube channel, so if you're interested, you can go check it out. If you hit the little Instagram button in my bio, there's a link that'll lead you right there, or you can just search Murder Geek and it'll take you to my page. But what are your thoughts on this case? Do you think Patrick will win his appeals? Let me know in the comments and follow for more true crime. Have you ever heard of Anna Walsh? Anna had a dual citizenship between Serbia and the United States. She worked in real estate and she was very successful. She was also a mother and a wife and just an all around good person. And the reason that we always say things like they lit up the room when they walked in is because usually they do. These kinds of things typically happen to good people. On January 4th of this year, the company that Anna worked for called in a welfare check for her. Anna was supposed to go to Washington on a business trip and her car was there, but nobody had heard from her. Police arrived to the Walsh home around 6.30 that evening and that's when they talked to her husband, Brian. Brian had told her employer that he had not filled out a missing person report. And when police arrived, he was cooperative and talked to them. Anna was last seen at her home on January 1st in Cohasset, sorry if I said that wrong, Massachusetts shortly after midnight before her and her husband went to bed. There was also a family friend or someone who related to them that was at the home and could verify that Anna was at the home around 1.30 in the morning. Brian says that they went to bed and then Anna had to be up between six and seven in the morning to get to the airport to fly to Washington to take care of some kind of work emergency. Initially, police say that Brian is being very cooperative. He's trying to help the investigators and everything seems to be going well. But I think there's also this question in their minds because he, Brian says that after Anna went to the airport, he had not heard from her since. And by January 4th, wouldn't you think that he would have filed a missing persons report or something? I mean, his wife was missing. He hadn't heard from her. And if you're married, I'm sure you would have talked every day. So police start searching, doing a ground search for Anna, looking everywhere for her, but they didn't find anything. But by January 7th, police had suspended the ground search for Anna without finding anything at all. But that's when police started looking into Brian a little closer and they started looking into his internet search history. On December 27th, Brian was searching things like, what is the best state for men to get a divorce in? So he was probably looking for ways to get out of his marriage with Anna. Part two is up. So here's part two to the disappearance of Anna Walsh. So on top of the internet search about divorcing his wife on December 27th, police also found very alarming searches he made on his son's tablet on January 1st. So I'm going to read them off, but on January 1st, he searched between 4.55 a.m. and 1.21. He searched things like how long before a body starts to smell, how to stop a body from decomposing, 10 ways to dispose of a body, can an identification be made on partial remains, how to clean up blood from wooden floor, among others. 
Brian also told investigators that he was out running errands at the local Whole Foods and CVS for his mother, but he is not seen on any surveillance footage doing anything like that. But he is seen on surveillance footage in a local Home Depot on January 2nd. In this surveillance footage, he is seen wearing a mask and gloves, and during his trip to Home Depot, the one that was just 10 miles from their house, he bought over $450 worth of cleaning supplies. And on January 8th, Brian was arrested for interfering with the investigation. They didn't have enough for murder, but they did have enough for this. His bond was set to $500,000 and will be seen next in court on February 9th for this charge. Then on January 9th and 10th, investigators reportedly found trash bags with blood, a hatchet and a hacksaw in a Peabody trash transfer station 45 minutes away from the couple's home. Apparently police also found blood in the basement and things are just really pointing to Brian at this point. And by January 17th, Brian was charged with Anna's murder. Brian has entered a plea of not guilty, but things seem pretty cut and dry here. And unfortunately, Anna has yet to be found. Her three kids are in state custody currently. So what are your thoughts on this? Are you as convinced as I am? Leave your thoughts in the comments and follow for more true crime. Have you ever heard of Brian Barrett? Brian was born on February 1st of 1984. He was described as easygoing and just a nice guy, but kind of shy and quiet. He loved sports and anything that had to do with him, and this is the bond that brought him and his brothers and his dad together. He played baseball and football in high school, but when he received a shoulder injury, he was unable to play anymore. Brian graduated high school in 2002 and then decided to enroll in Erie Community College to receive his two-year degree. It was after this that he decided to become a teacher, so he enrolled in Buffalo State College. But while he was going to school, he took a part-time job at a place called Dynabraid. Here, he was well-liked by his co-workers and he was a hard worker. Now, this is one of his co-workers. His name is Thomas Montgomery. Thomas was a 46-year-old man who had worked at Dynabraid for over 12 years. He had a wife, two daughters, and he was a Sunday school teacher. His life consisted of going to work, taking his daughters where they needed to go, and then once a week he would go to poker night with his buddies. He was pretty upset about this though because life just hadn't gone the way he had planned. Trying to shake things up, in May of 2005, Thomas decided to sign onto a website called pogo.com. It was on this website that he started entering chat rooms and he used the name Marine Sniper. It didn't take long for him to start receiving personal messages from a girl called Tall Hot Blonde. This girl said she was 18 years old and Thomas decided to tell her that he was also 18 years old even though he was 46. Now this wasn't a one-time conversation. Thomas and Tall Hot Blonde started talking more and more and eventually started sharing more personal information about each other. Eventually Tall Hot Blonde told Thomas that she was, her real name was Jessie, she was from West Virginia and she was exactly that, a Tall Hot Blonde. Thomas told her that his name was Tommy and he was still active in the Marines. He said he was this really good looking, well built man and it was basically all a lie. But eventually Jesse and Tommy would send pictures to each other. Jesse would send pictures that became more and more risque as their conversations went on. And Thomas sent her this photo of him in the Marines from many years back. But the conversations got deeper and they started flirting a lot more. This went on for almost a year and eventually Tommy proposed to Jesse, even though the two had never met. Part two is up. This is part two to the catfishing gone wrong story. So at this point, Thomas has been talking to Tall Hot Blonde for almost a year. They're building an entire future together, planning to get married and start a family like crazy things. Thomas is taking it so far that he even goes to work and tells people that he's going to leave his wife and go marry this girl in West Virginia. 
even though she believes he's an 18-year-old Marine while he's 46 years old. But in February of 2006, Thomas's wife, Cindy, would find out about it. It just so happened that Tall Hot Blonde, or Jesse, would message Thomas while one of the girls was on the computer. That's when Cindy decided to take matters into her, oh, her own hands, and she sent Tall Hot Blonde, or Jesse, a letter with a picture of her family, and she said, this is Tommy. So at this point, Jesse knows the truth, and she's obviously upset. She breaks things off with Thomas immediately, but when she starts becoming skeptical of what Cindy said, she decides to reach out to Brian. She asks Brian if this is true, and he says, yeah, Thomas is a 46-year-old man who's married and has two kids. So this is when Jesse and Brian start talking, and things get way more intimate between them two. Jesse and Brian go public with their relationship, and this infuriates Thomas. But while Jesse is talking to Brian, she's still messaging Thomas on the side, saying things like, I wish Tommy was real, and if he was real, I'd hold on to him forever. So she's kind of playing this game between the two men. Finally, Brian has plans to go to North Carolina, and he asks if he can meet Jesse because he's going to be driving close to her house. She agrees. They plan to meet. But here's the thing. Jesse cancels the meeting, so Brian's not going to be able to meet Jesse after all. But Thomas had found out about the meeting, but he didn't find that the meeting had been canceled. So he was absolutely furious that Brian was going to be able to meet the girl of his dreams while he never could. So on September 17th of 2006, Thomas shot and killed Brian when he was just finishing his shift at 10 p.m. that night. Eventually, police would put the pieces together with this love triangle and go and arrest Thomas. Worried for Jesse's safety, they had the local West Virginia police go check on her. But when they arrived, they found her mother, Mary. And as it would turn out, Mary was actually Jesse or Tall Hot Blonde, and she had stolen her daughter's identity to talk to strange men on the internet. Thomas pled guilty to manslaughter and was sent to 20 years in prison, but they were never able to charge Mary with anything. I did a deeper dive of this case over on my YouTube channel. If you click the Instagram button, there's a link to go there, or you can just search Murder Geek and you'll find me that way. But what are your thoughts on this? Leave them down in the comments and follow for more true crime. Have you ever heard of Rachel Mellenskamp? Rachel was a seventh grader in Bolinbrook, Illinois. She was bright, she was funny, she was popular, she was very well liked. It was not a problem at all for her to make any friends. Rachel's parents divorced when she was very young. Her father, Jeff, moved to Dallas, Texas, while her mother, Amy, stayed in Illinois and eventually remarried. Rachel stayed in Illinois with her mother. January 31st of 1996, Rachel woke up not feeling the greatest, so she decided to stay home from school. Her stepfather, Vincent, would be the one that stayed home with her that day. When her mother and the rest of the family came home around 5 p.m. that evening, Rachel was gone. She had just vanished from her bedroom. This was a very cold day in Illinois, but despite that, the community came together, bundled up, and started just searching everywhere they could think of for Rachel. Rachel's mother, Amy, did call the police, but she said that it took police over an hour to get to their house, despite claiming that her daughter was missing. Early on in the investigation, police were looking at uh, Rachel being a possible runaway. Despite her shoes, her coats, and all of her things still being in the house, the only thing that was missing was the blanket that Amy was sleeping in and the pillows. Police obviously conducted an interview with Vincent. Vincent's story seemed to be a little strange though. Vincent claims that he and Rachel spent the day just kind of vegging out. They were playing Nintendo for a big, a good part of the day and just watching TV, just kind of hanging out and relaxing so that Rachel could start to feel better. Vincent says that around 2 p.m., 2 to 2.30 p.m., Rachel said that she was tired and she wanted to go to sleep. Vincent says that he decided to take the dog for a walk during this time. He says when he left the house, he didn't lock the door. During this walk with the dog, the dog got out of his collar and started chasing a rabbit, according to Vincent. Vincent says that he chased the dog for a short time and then went back into the house. 
Vincent says that a real estate broker eventually brought the dog back to the house, but there is some conflicting stories. In some parts, I read that Vincent said he checked on Rachel when he got back and she was sleeping soundly. Other reports say that he did not check on Rachel at all after returning back to the house. But it was not discovered that Rachel was missing until 5 p.m. that evening. And Vincent was not the one to report Rachel missing. Part two is up. So here's part two to the disappearance of Rachel Mellenskamp. So Rachel went missing and the entire community came together to try to find Rachel, despite it being like negative 30 that day. They looked everywhere and they found absolutely no trace of Rachel. While searching in Rachel's room, police found her diary stuffed in between her bed. Reading in the diary, they found certain excerpts from Rachel saying that she was being essayed by Vincent. And looking into Vincent's background, they found that he had several DV claims against him. Vincent claimed that he had absolutely nothing to do with Rachel's disappearance. Vincent also had several scratches all over his body, but he claimed that he had just recently serviced one of their cars and that's where these scratches came from. They never found any solid evidence that Vincent was involved, so he was never arrested, but Rachel has also never been found. But looking around the area that the family lived, there are several lakes pretty close by that anyone could hide a body. And if you really think about it, Vincent had all day to cover his tracks. But despite all this, Rachel's body has never been found and she has never been found. And I would think that if she was a runaway, there would have been some kind of sighting by now. I guess there is also the possibility that someone entered their home while Vincent was out with the dog, but that seems pretty risky to me, like very risky behavior. I find it pretty hard to believe that somebody would risk coming into a home in broad daylight to kidnap a child. Rachel's mother did leave Vincent for a short period, but they ended up getting back together and moving and they've stayed under the radar this entire time. I did a little bit of a deeper dive over on my YouTube channel, so if you want to check that out, it's linked in my bio. You can hit the little Instagram button, it'll take you right there. You can also just search Murder Geek in YouTube and it'll take you to that page. But what are your thoughts on this? I personally think Vincent's involved, but I'd love to know your thoughts. Let me know down in the comments and follow for more true crime. Have you ever heard of the Covina Massacre? And excuse the stuffiness, I've been really under the weather for the last week. This is the Ortega family and they lived in Covina, California, which is a suburb of Los Angeles. Joe and Alice were the mother and father in this family. Joe was only a second generation American and his parents had immigrated over here. Joe had done pretty well for himself. He had uh, built his own business and was kind of just living the American dream. After Joe retired, one of his sons took over his business and grew it from there. So financially, the family was doing just fine. Joe and Alice were very family oriented. They loved spending time with all of their children and their grandchildren. In fact, every Christmas Eve, Alice and Joe would have their entire family come to their house where they would celebrate Christmas together and just spend time together. December 24th of 2008 was no different. Everyone went to Joe and Alice's house. They were just hanging out, having a good time. Some of the kids were in the backyard playing by the pool while there was a group of people in the living room playing a game of Texas Hold'em. But around 11 p.m., one of the youngest daughters, Katrina, noticed that someone was walking up towards the house. This person was dressed up as Santa Claus. Katrina, being eight years old, was really excited, so she ran to the front door and threw it open to greet Santa Claus. But instead of presents, this Santa Claus had a gun. And as soon as he entered the house, he opened fire on the entire family. After the Santa Claus opened fire, many of the adults in the living room playing Texas Hold'em hit the floor, while the people in the backyard were able to make an escape and run to the neighbors to ask them to call 911. After the Santa Claus thought he had killed everybody, he went and searched the house. When he was satisfied, he took out a homemade flamethrower. It was with this flamethrower that he set the entire house on fire. 
By the time police and fire and EMS arrived, the house was completely ablaze, with some reports saying that flames reached as high as 50 feet. Sadly, anyone who was trapped in the house when the fire started would succumb to their injuries. When police began investigating, witnesses saw a blue Dodge car driving away from the scene. What was interesting about this car is that the car had no headlights on whatsoever, which is weird. That same night, 40 miles away, a 911 call came in about a Bruce Pad Padro. He had been found dead in his brother's house. Part two is up. Okay, so here's part two to the Covina massacre. So 40 minutes away from the tragedy of the Ortega family, they found the body of Bruce Padro. The similarities between Bruce's scene and the Ortega family scene kind of led police to believe that maybe the two were connected. Looking into Bruce's history, they realized that he was a local and he was just kind of an all around not so nice dude. He completely abandoned his child and just kind of left them high and dry. And then when he met Sylvia Ortega, he didn't tell her anything about his child that he had abandoned. Bruce and Sylvia ended up getting married, but the shock of finding out that Bruce had abandoned a child and some money issues led to a divorce. Sylvia was able to keep an engagement ring and was awarded $17,000 in a settlement suit in their divorce and was also awarded spousal support and this really seemed to anger Bruce. In 2008, Bruce's life seemed to be just completely falling apart. He broke his ankle and then he got fired from his job because he was billing for time that he wasn't actually working. And with the divorce from Sylvia, everything just seemed to be falling apart. During this time, Bruce bought multiple guns, and for someone who didn't, didn't sound like he had any guns before, this was really strange behavior. Police were able to interview some of the surviving family members of the uh, massacre, and they pointed to Bruce being the attacker. Police were also able to connect Bruce to the car that was seen fleeing the scene, but when they found the car, the thing essentially exploded, and police believe that it was rigged to do just that. They also found evidence that Bruce maybe tried leaving the country after committing this act, and he also had an entire list of people he wanted to attack that night. But upon finding Bruce's body, he had pretty severe burns all over himself, so police have a theory that the fire started much sooner than Bruce had anticipated, and because of that, he ended up ending his own life. When talking to a friend of Bruce, they found that Bruce was really blaming Sylvia for his life falling apart. It looked like he was not able to take any accountability for what he had done. And because of this, the Ortega family suffered. The Ortega family continues to press forward and they're just really an amazing family that often speak out against gun violence. I did a much deeper dive of this story over on my YouTube channel. It's linked in my bio. If you hit the little Instagram button, it can take you to YouTube as well. Or you can just search Murder Geek and you'll find it there. But what are your thoughts on this? Let me know down in the comments and follow for more true crime. Have you ever heard of Christopher Miller? Christopher lives in Madison, Wisconsin, but he has family in Rockford, Illinois, as well as Chicago, Illinois. On November 18th of 2022, Christopher traveled from Madison, Wisconsin down to Rockford, Illinois to get his brother so they could go to Chicago and get his nephew. When they went to Chicago, Christopher spent some time with his mother, his brother, and his nephew before making the trip back up to Madison, Wisconsin. But Christopher never made it home. The following details are all provided by the Wisconsin State Patrol, so bear with me. Police say that Christopher was involved in a pursuit. On I-39 and I-90 around 2.30 in the morning on November 19th, police say that he crashed his car but kept driving into Janesville, Wisconsin. Police claim that Christopher continued to drive his car until it became disabled. After Christopher's car became disabled, according to police officers, they say that Christopher took off on foot southbound into the ditch. 
Police officers claimed that they had a canine, a canine unit there within two minutes of Christopher disappearing, but the dogs were never able to pick up any scent from Christopher and they never found him. Christopher has not been seen again since this incident. On November 21st, the Wisconsin Highway Patrol handed over the investigation to Rock County, Wisconsin, but Rock County handed over the investigation to Madison on November 28th. Investigators claim that they searched the surrounding area with a canine unit, but they also say that they use drones to search the area, but there has not been a trace of Christopher anywhere. Christopher's family is trying to get the state patrol to release body cam footage from the incident, but they refuse. They're saying that since it's an ongoing investigation, they can't release this footage without a higher up approving it first. Family has checked with surrounding hospitals, jails, just anywhere they can think of to see if they have seen any sign of Christopher at all, but he seemingly vanished into thin air. Police officers have his phone, and so they have, his family has no way of contacting him via his phone. But the police are still looking for him as a wanted person, even though it's pretty clear that he's missing. He has kids at home that he takes care of. He has a family at home that he would want to go back home to. So the fact that he's just disappeared into thin air is very strange to me. So if you live in the Wisconsin area, please keep a lookout for Christopher Miller. His family wants him to come home safely. Have you ever heard of Tony Turner? Tony was an artist. She was described as magnetic and wonderful. And as you can see, she was also very beautiful. And she was only 22 years old when she went missing. Around 6 p.m. on December 30th of 2019, Tony decided to stop for some tea at Dobra Tea in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She then got on a city bus to go to the Hazelwood neighborhood in Pittsburgh, which was where she lived. The bus driver watched her get off at her normal stop and then Tony vanished. That same evening, a firefighter was riding his bike along the Homestead Grays Bridge. He happened to notice a ceramic pot, women's shoes, and a purse laying on the pedestrian sidewalk. He wasn't able to carry the shoes and the ceramic pot, so he decided to just take the purse and take it home. When he got home, he started looking through the purse to try to find the identity of whoever owned it. Inside, he found a cell phone, keys, a water bottle, and a journal. He decided to call one of the contacts in the cell phone and got a hold of one of Tony's aunts. He explained how he had found the purse and was just trying to get the purse back to its owner. Tony's aunt said that it was Tony's and he brought the purse back to Tony's family on Tuesday morning. The firefighter also told the family about the women's shoes in the ceramic pot sitting next to the purse. Tony's family decided to go to the bridge and collect those other items, but by the time they got to the bridge, the shoes and the ceramic pot were gone. Now this bridge is not somewhere that Tony would usually walk to, so her family was confused as to why her purse was there. But Tony was also known for losing her cell phone, so her family figured that she had left it on the bus and somebody else had picked them up and placed them on the bridge. Tony's mother was trying to reach her at her home, but wasn't able to get a hold of her anywhere. Tony had been texting her sister on Monday night, but didn't respond after a while. Her sister wasn't too worried about this. She figured that Tony just had to work early in the morning and had fallen asleep and that she would talk to her later. But soon the family would find out that Tony never made it to work that morning. She was scheduled to work at eight in the morning and she never showed up. This was very unlike Tony. She was always the kind of person that would call in and let her employer know if she wasn't going to make it. Part two is up. This is part two to Tony Turner. So after her family found out that she had not shown up to work and not called anybody, her purse being on that bridge was much more scary. That's when they called the Pitt Pittsburgh Police Department and filed a missing persons report. No one can verify if Tony ever made it home that night. There was a red coat found in her home and she was supposedly wearing it on Monday night, but she could have came home and then gone back out into the city. 
Tony's roommate was also out of town for the holidays, so she couldn't verify if Tony had ever made it home either. That's when Tony's family started looking at her journal, and while there were some sad entries in the journal, nothing really led to them believing that Tony wanted to harm herself. But regardless, Tony's family decided that they wanted to look in the area under the bridge to see if they could find Tony, but nothing was ever found. They also started pleading for whoever had picked up the women's shoes and the ceramic pot that was also found by the firefighter. They started asking if whoever had picked it up could bring it back so they could be examined, but no one ever spoke up saying that they had picked up the pot or the women's shoes. Tony's friends and family do not believe that she ever would have harmed herself. Police did start investigating. They posted a picture on their Facebook page that was shared hundreds of times. And they also went and talked to the employees at the tea shop that she liked to go to. And they also talked to the bus driver, but nothing seemed unusual about Tony that day. It was when the investigation kind of went cold and people stopped talking about Tony that police started wondering if she had hurt herself. And it seemed like they were really leaning that way, but her family is adamant that she wouldn't, and I think that they would know best. But to this day, there has been no trace of Tony, and no one knows where she went. And people don't just vanish like this, not into thin air, not with today's technology and cell phones and all that stuff. So what are your thoughts on this case? Let me know down in the comments and follow for more true crime. Have you ever heard of Steve Carter? Steve was 35 years old. He was adopted when he was four years old. And while he had had a very comfortable life with his adoptive family, he was always wondering where he came from. In 2011, Steve read the story of Carlina White. She was someone who was kidnapped from a hospital and later found out she was a missing person. This inspired him to start looking at missing persons websites. That is when he stumbled upon this age progression photo, and it's, he says that it gave him chills. He just knew it was him. He soon found out that he was born in Hawaii and went missing when he was just six months old. On June 21st of 1977, his mother took him out for a walk and just vanished. The thing is, she had vanished once before, so Steve's father wasn't that concerned. But when she didn't come back for three weeks, that's when he reported them missing. As it would turn out, his mother Charlotte took him to somebody's house, gave him a fake name and fake birthday, and then she was taken to a psychiatric ward. When she got out of the psychiatric ward, she vanished. This left her son a ward of the state. Steve was eventually brought into an orphanage, and when he was four years old, he was adopted by his adoptive parents. Since his mother had given him a fake name and a fake date of birth, they were not able to make the connection between the missing child and this baby in the orphanage. So after reading this story and realizing that he could very easily be this child, he decided to take a DNA test, and as it would turn out, he was the child that went missing. So Steve was reunited with his biological family. What do you think about this story? Let me know down in the comments and follow for more true crime. Okay, third and final part to Chance Engelbert. So Chance left Bailey's grandparents' house around 7.30 that evening, on the evening of July 6th. When he talked to his best friend Matt, he said that he was headed north towards Torrington, but when he talked to Bailey, he told her that he was headed south before hanging up on her. Matt called Chance's mom, wanting to know if she would be able to go pick him up, but since they had just had this argument and Chance had asked for this boundary of not speaking for a week, she was really hesitant to go look for him or go f pick him up. But Chance had stopped responding to everybody at this point. Nobody could get a hold of him at all. That's when his mother, Katie, tried to reach out to him by saying, hey, I have a question, can you call me? There was a storm that was getting ready to hit the area around nine o'clock that evening. It was a pretty bad storm with um, an inch of rain and the rivers were going to rise that evening because of the storm. The winds were pretty bad too. But at 9.08, Chance responded to his aunt with some strange text messages. One text message said, I'm with the straight faced emoji. And the other one said, I-B-D-E-S-E-R-E-A-L-L-Y-G. She responded with, what 
are you okay? And she never got a response, nor did anybody else. By the next day, everyone was very worried about Chance and where he had gone because nobody could find him. That is when Bailey and her family decided to file a missing persons report that the police didn't take seriously at first. Bailey and her family said that they had to make several calls before anyone would take this serious. But eventually there was a pretty big search group out looking for Chance, but they didn't find anything. Police were able to ping his last known location around 10 p.m. that evening, and that pinged at a truck stop three miles away from Bailey's parents' grandparents' house. A couple of odd things to note is that a couple of days after Chance went missing, Bailey asked police officers for a death certificate. This raised a lot of uh, red flags for many people, including myself, but she explained it that she was a young mother with a young child and would need to provide for this baby and Chance's life insurance would do that. But I think it's also important to note that Bailey and her family have been nothing but helpful to police. They've always been available for questioning or anything that they needed. I did a deeper dive to this case over on my YouTube channel, so if that's something you're interested, it's linked in my bio. You can also just search Murder Geek on YouTube and you'll find it there. But what are your thoughts on this case? Let me know down in the comments and follow for more true crime. So this is part two to Chance Engelbert. So Chance and his best friend Matt had just recently gotten jobs at the same place working in propane. These jobs were set to start on July 8th of 2019. So this meant that Chance and Matt both had 4th of July week off. They had originally planned to go to Chance's family ranch and do hunting and fishing and those kinds of things, but Chance would get into an argument with his mother and so Chance decided he wanted a week break from talking to his mom. So he and Matt both made other plans. Matt decided to go hang out with some other friends and Bailey and Chance decided to go to Nebraska to spend time with Bailey's family. On July 6th, Chance and Bailey were in Nebraska and they had a full day planned. Chance was going to go with Bailey's brother and her father to go golfing all day and then that evening they were going to meet with some of Bailey's friends and have dinner and just hang out. But it was a beautiful July day so Bailey decided to take their son and go to the golf course and see how everyone was doing. But when Bailey got there, Chance was really upset. Apparently her brother or her father had made a comment about Chance making less money at his new job than he did at his old job. Chance told Bailey he wanted to leave, so they got in the car and drove away. While in the car, Chance told Bailey that he wanted to go home, so she went to her grandparents' house where they were staying. But when they got there, Chance said, no, I want to go home home, which was back in Wyoming. Bailey decided that they were going to leave, so she was going to run inside and grab some clothes. But Chance got out of the car and just started walking away. Bailey took Banks out of the car, brought him inside to her grandmother, and then ran outside to find Chance, but he was gone already. Bailey said that this was pretty typical for Chance, that he would often just walk away from any arguments that they were having, so she decided to just let him cool off, he would eventually come back, but Chance never came back. Chance and Bailey had got back to her grandparents' house around 7.15 to 7.20ish. Around 7.35, Chance called his buddy Matt and asked him to come pick him up. But Chance was having a couple of drinks with his friends, so he wasn't able to drive the three hours to pick Chance up. So Matt decided that he was going to call around and see if anyone else could come get him. Chance had told him that he was walking north towards Torrington, Nebraska. And this would have been in the direction of South Dakota or Wyoming where Chance lived. Chance lived in Wyoming and his family lived in South Dakota. Bailey was also trying to call Chance and eventually she was able to get a hold of him. During this conversation, he told Bailey that he was going south and then hung up on her. I'm sorry, but there's going to have to be a part three. Have you ever heard of Joanna Lopez? So this is a very, very strange case, as in, I don't know if it's real or not. So the story goes that on January 14th of 1989, several kids saw this missing poster flash on their screens late at night in Chicago. Chicago's WMAQ's network is the one who broadcast this originally. 
So obviously it shows a really, really blurry picture of a missing person, the name and a number to call. This number was at one point the missing persons unit in Chicago, but I don't think it's that anymore, but I haven't called it either. This missing persons poster was flashed one time and supposedly it's never been seen again, but now a group of people on Reddit are trying to figure out if Joanna is real and if she is, who is she? Where is she? Where did she go missing from? And according to Reddit, this news station never broadcast a missing persons photo like this again. So is this some kind of hoax? Is Joanna a real person? What's going on here? It being a hoax or some kind of ARG is a possibility because Max Headroom was something that happened in Chicago in 1987. But if it is a hoax, this is a really, really cruel hoax. But really, nothing is known about Joanna. So what are your thoughts on this case? Let me know down in the comments and follow for more strange true crime.